Hi everyone, and welcome to this comfy, no-nonsense guide on installing Arch Linux with encryption. In today's video, I'm going to be doing a UEFI install with an encrypted root partition. And as you can tell, I've already plugged in my Arch Linux USB stick, and I'm going to press enter on the first option. Once we're done setting up the system today, when you turn it on, you're going to be prompted for a password. That password is going to unlock all of your files and give you access to them as you would on a normal system. The reason for this password is to protect your files if anybody was ever able to steal your hard drive or SSD and plug it into their computer. This prevents your files from falling into the wrong hands. While the system is done booting now and we're at the Arch Linux shell, the first thing I'm going to do is run the set font space dash D command, which is going to make our font size twice as big. I'm going to press enter over here. And obviously this command is not necessary if you're just doing the install by yourself, but for the sake of my viewers and most importantly, their eyes, I'm going to make the text a little bigger in today's guide. The next thing we want to do is clear the screen by typing clear or pressing control L, and then we're going to load a keyboard layout. To do this, we're going to type load keys space IT, for example, for the Italian layout and press enter. Now I have an Italian keyboard layout, but I'm going to go back to the US one by typing load keys space US, just like that. Now that we have the keyboard and the terminal how we want it, we need to start setting up our internet connection. I highly recommend plugging in an ethernet cable into your computer or laptop to make sure that this process is as easy as possible. But if your only way of accessing the internet is Wi-Fi, you can use the IWCTL utility and press enter over here to enter the IWD shell. Now, obviously I can demonstrate this in great detail since I'm on a virtual machine right now and I can't show Wi-Fi. However, I'm gonna have a guide linked in the description that shows you how to do everything. In short, you're going to want to type station space list to see all the Wi-Fi devices on your computer. And then station, let's say WLAN 0 is one of my Wi-Fi devices, space get dash networks. And this command would list all the networks on the, you know, in the surrounding area. Obviously, it's not working because I don't have Wi-Fi on this virtual machine. But once you're done setting all that up, you can type exit and press enter and go back to the main terminal screen. To make sure you have internet access, all you got to do is type ping and then a domain name like denshi.org for example, press enter and confirm that it does indeed ping the site and ping back. I'm going to type control C to close this command. Now that we have an internet connection, we can start configuring our disks. I'm going to type lsblk to see the situation. As you can see, there's a disk right there with 16 gigabytes of space. That's the main one I'm going to be using in today's video, and it's named SDA. The tool I'm going to be using to configure it is CF Disk, which is a simple graphical tool to configure disks. To select our disk, we're going to add forward slash dev forward slash SDA as an option. Now, you may not have SDA as your disk. You may have SDB, SDC, and so on, like all the letters of the alphabet. Or maybe you might have NVMe 0 and 1, or 1 and 1, or something like that, or even MMC BLK1 if you're using eMMC storage. In my case, I'm using a regular SATA device, so I'm going to do SDA, just like that. Now, pressing Enter. If your disk is completely fresh and new and you've never used it before, you might be prompted for a label type. Since today's video is a UEFI install, I'm going to pick GPT and press enter. Once again, if your disk is new, you're going to see nothing here. It's just going to say free space and you can start partitioning. However, your disk may look something more like this with multiple partitions. Because we're going to be wiping everything and installing only Linux in today's video, I'm going to go to every single one of these partitions using the up and down arrows, and then using my left and right arrows, I'm going to go to the delete option and press enter. Then I'm going to go down to the next one, go to the delete and press enter, and once again to the next one and go down and press enter on delete we can start configuring our basic partitions. The first one is going to be a 512 capital M for Mibibytes partition, which we're going to use for booting. So I'm going to press enter, and as you can see, it's configured it. Then we're going to be left with this free space. All you got to do here is press enter and leave it at the default size because it's going to fill up the rest of the disk by default. Press enter again, and you'll have a new partition. You can leave these pretty much like this by default. Now I'm going to go down to right, press enter, type yes, and it's gonna permanently write those changes to the disk. Finally, we can go down to where it says quit and press enter to leave CF disk. All right, so if we run LSBLK again, as you can see, we have SDA1 and SDA2 configured over there. The first thing we're gonna do is format our boot partition. This is pretty straightforward. All we gotta do is run mkfs.fat space dash capital F 32 space forward slash dev forward slash SDA1, just like that. We're gonna press enter and it's done. 
However, our root partition, because we're going to be encrypting it, is going to be a little bit more tricky. We're going to run crypt setup, just like that, lux, capital F, format, space, forward slash dev, forward slash SDA2, and press enter. This will give you a warning about overriding data. We're going to type yes in capital letters over here and press enter. And now we're going to have to come up with a password for the disk. Since this video is just an example, I'm going to do one, two, three, four. Now, obviously in real life, you want to use a much more secure password than that, but one, two, three, four will do for the purposes of this video. So I'm going to press enter. I'm going to type it again for the verification, press enter. And now it's going to start encrypting and formatting the drive. Now this might take a little bit, so give it a while. All right, so it's done, which means that we can now use the crypt setup tool to open the encrypted partition. We're going to run crypt setup open forward slash dev forward slash SDA2, make sure you select the right partition here, and then you have to give it a name. Now in today's video, I'm gonna be using crypt root, which is a pretty common one. So I'm gonna press enter, and now we have to type the password which we set, which is one, two, three, four, and we're gonna press enter. All right, so as you can see, it's opened, and now if we run LSBLK again, we'll see that we have SDA, SDA1 and SDA2 as partitions, but under SDA2, we have another thing that says crypt root. That is gonna be our decrypted root partition. Now that we've decrypted it, we can set a file system on it like we did with SDA1. So I'm gonna run MKFS, dot ext4 or alternatively if you prefer butterfs you can do mkfs dot btrfs i'm going to stick to ext4 since it's the more default one forward slash dev forward slash mapper forward slash crypt root just like that so i'm going to press enter and as you can see it's formatted it using ext4 now that we've done all of our disk formatting with all the file systems we can actually start mounting them so i'm going to run mount forward slash dev forward slash mapper, forward slash crypt root. Make sure you select your root partition first. And I'm gonna to mount to forward slash MNT, just like that. Then we're gonna run MKDIR, forward slash MNT, forward slash boot. We're making this special boot directory to put our boot partition on. So I'm gonna press enter. I'm gonna type mount, forward slash dev, forward slash SDA1. Remember the boot partition is not encrypted so we can just refer to it as SDA1, forward slash MNT, then forward slash boot, and I'm gonna press enter. If we run LSBLK again, as you can see, SDA1 is mounted in MNT boot, and our crypt root, our decrypted partition, is mounted in MNT. So all of our partition stuff is set up correctly. With that done, we can actually start installing Arch Linux now. But before we run the pack strap command, I'm gonna give you guys an important recommendation. I'm gonna use the nano text editor to go into forward slash etsy forward slash pacman.conf which is a file on the Arch Linux ISO, which configures the package manager. Once we enter this file, I'm gonna go down all the way to this section that says parallel downloads. And I'm gonna go to the P and delete this pound symbol that's right in front of it, which uncomments it. Then you wanna set the number next to it to something like four, or depending on how many threads your computer has. This virtual machine is four, so I'm gonna set it to four. What this option allows Pac-Man to do is download multiple packages at once. So if your internet connection is relatively fast, this will really speed up the process of installing Arch Linux and also just installing packages in general. So I'm gonna press Control O to write the changes and press Enter, and then I'm gonna press Control X to exit the text editor. So now that we're out, we can run packstrap space dash MNT and start selecting the packages we want to install on our system. Obviously the important ones are base, then base-devel, which adds important utilities like GCC and sudo. We're also going to install the nano text editor. I'm gonna install Vim because I really like it. Network manager, because it's a very important tool for setting up Wi-Fi or ethernet or whatever you need. We also need LVM2 and crypt setup for the encryption to work properly. We're gonna need grub and EFI boot MGR. And of course, we're gonna need Linux. And if you have a relatively modern computer, you're also gonna to wanna to install Linux dash firmware. I'm gonna just make that a little bit uh, more obvious by spacing it out over here. But essentially this Linux firmware package has a bunch of drivers for important devices you may have on your computer, for example, Wi-Fi. Now there might be things that we're actually missing from this list of packages, but it's okay because we can always install them while we're configuring Arch Linux in our new system. So I'm gonna press 
enter, and it's going to start downloading the repositories and downloading all the packages. As you can see, it's downloading four packages at once, like we configured it to do. This might take a while, depending on your internet connection speed and so, so don't be worried if it takes a long time. It successfully ran the backstop command. It took a little while, 29.76 seconds, but it has finished. And before we go into our Arch Linux system and start configuring it further, the last thing we want to do in the Arch ISO is run genfstab to generate the fstab file. So you're going to run genfstab space dash capital U and then the directory you mounted the root partition in, which is forward slash mnt and press enter. Now this is going to send the output to a terminal so we can quickly look at it before we actually pipe it. As you can see we have two main partitions, dev mapper crypt root which is mounted to the forward slash or the root and dev sda1 which is mounted to forward slash boot. Now that looks all perfectly fine to me, there's no weird additional stuff that might mess up our system so that gets my stamp of approval. We're going to run the command again with the angled bracket a single one over there and then send the output to forward slash mnt forward slash Etsy forward slash fstab, just like that. To check the contents of it, we're going to do cat forward slash mnt forward slash etsy forward slash fstab, and as you can see, it looks perfectly fine. All right, now that we have the fstab set up, we can run arch dash ch root, just like that, forward slash mnt, and now we've successfully entered our Arch Linux system. The first thing we're going to do is set the time zone for our system. The time zones are available in a directory called user share zone info. As you can see, there's a lot of regions here. And if you go to a specific one like America, there's even more time zones. So I'm going to pick, I don't know, America, New York. So to activate one of those time zones as the default, we're going to do ln space dash sf forward slash user share zone info, then the actual time zone. So for example, America, new underscore York, just like that. And I'm going to send this, I'm going to link this to Etsy local time, just like that, forward slash Etsy forward slash local time. And I'm going to press enter. The next thing we want to do is synchronize the hardware clock, which is pretty easy. All I got to do is run HW clock dash dash S Y S T O H C, just like that and press enter. And if you want to check to make sure the date is set correctly, you can just run the date command, which shows you the current date and time. The next thing is the locale. So the locale on the Linux system dictates how things are formatted. For example, dates and when the week starts, if it starts on Monday, on Sunday or whatever you have. So to customize that, we're going to use the nano text editor that we used earlier. We're going to go to forward slash etsy forward slash locale dot gen. So if you press enter over here and go down, 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 down using a down arrow all the way to the locale you want. In my case, it's going to be en underscore us. There you go. I just saw it. Us dot utf dash eight. You want to remove the pound sign over here to uncomment the line and then press control O and press enter to write and then control X to exit the file. Now we can run locale dash gen to generate the locale successfully. And as you can see, it says generation complete. Now we also have to configure it in a special file called locale.com. So I'm going to run nano forward slash etsy locale.conf, not gen this time, dot conf. And we're going to go into that file and we're going to type lang equals en underscore us dot utf dash eight. That's my locale, the US, you know, United States one. There's also lots of other ones. Just make sure you get the same one as the one in the list you were looking at. And now you can do control O and press enter to write the contents of the file and press control X to exit it. I'm also going to change the host name of our computer. So as you can see on our shell, it says root at arch ISO. You can change that arch ISO to pretty much anything you want. In my case, I'm going to use nano to go to Etsy host name just like that. I'm going to set it to Alex Arch, just like that. that. That looks pretty cool. I'm going to do Control O and press Enter. I'm going to do Control X to exit the text editor. The next step is to set the password for our root user. To do this, we can just type P-A-S-S-W-D and press Enter, and you can just set it to whatever you want. I'm going to do one, two, three, four, since you know this is just an example, but obviously you should set it to something relatively secure if you don't want people accessing the root user on your computer. Speaking of passwords, we actually have to set up sudo on the computer. If you're not familiar, sudo is the command which allows somebody on Linux to have access to super user privileges, you know, install packages and whatnot, without having to be the root user. It basically gives you admin privileges on Linux. So to do that, we're going to run the command v sudo and press enter. This is going to bring you to this text editor, which is actually Vim. Now, if you don't know how to use Vim, that's fine. You can do a colon and then wq to exit it and go back to the vsudo command and at the beginning type 
editor in capital letters equals nano and press space. This way when you press enter and run vSudo again, it will open it in nano. This file configures sudo, and if you go all the way to the bottom, you'll see this line that says we all 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 all, and it's a lot of alls, commented out. So we're going to get rid of the pound sign over here, and just leave it as percentage wheel all 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 all. Now, as the text implies, you can uncomment it to allow members of group wheel to execute any command. So I'm going to do control O, press enter, control X to exit it, and now we're going to run user add dash M dash capital G wheel. That means we're adding this user to the wheel group dash S forward slash bin forward slash bash. It's going to send us to the bash shell when we log in. And I'm going to give this new user a name. I'm going to name him Alex. So I'm going to press enter. And now I'm going to run PASSWD or password. And I'm going to give it the option Alex, which customizes Alex's password. I'm going to press enter. I'm going to set it to one, two, three, four, just like that. Not very secure, but once again, this is just an example. And now you've created a new user, given that user pseudo permissions by adding that user to the wheel group, and you've set the password for that user. So good on you. That's pretty much everything that you need to do on a default Arch install already done. However, there are a couple more things that we want to do to actually have this setup work as an encrypted setup. More specifically, there are two steps. First, we need to configure our init CPIO. And second, we have to configure our bootloader, which in this tutorial is going to be grub. For the init CPIO step, all you got to do is run nano and go into forward slash etsy forward slash mkinitcpio.conf, open up this file and go down all the way until you see the hooks section. As you can see, it says hooks, base, udev, auto detect, and so on. You're going to go all the way to the block section. And after here, you want to add encrypt and LVM2 with a space between them, as if they were two new options. Now that you've added those, you can do Control O, press Enter, and Control X. These basically allow your system to support booting from an encrypted root partition when you turn it on. And if you don't enable this and then regenerate the init CPIO, your system will not boot up successfully. So to regenerate the CPIO, we're going to run MK init CPIO dash capital P and press enter. Now this might take a while, but when it's running, make sure you see the encrypt and LVM2 build hooks over there. So make sure those are running fine without any errors. And also don't worry too much about the warnings since those are mostly for generic hardware, which won't really apply to you. All right, so now that we've successfully configured the init CPIO, we're gonna move on to the next step of encryption, which is setting up the bootloader. Now this tends to be the hardest step, and at least in my own personal experience, the one I get stuck on the most. So I'm gonna make sure to go through every single step slowly and deliberately so that you understand every part and the chance of messing up is lowered as much as possible. So the first thing we're gonna do is install grub, since that is the bootloader we're using today. We're gonna to run grub-install, then we're gonna pass it the EFI directory option by doing dash dash EFI dash directory, equals forward slash boot, since that is our boot partition after all, it's mounted there. And then if you want to, you can pass the dash dash bootloader dash ID, and then set this to like, I don't know, Alex Linux or whatever you want. Uh, this is just vain, you know, this is just giving your bootloader a name, like if you want to call this my arch or whatever you want. And then we're going to pass it the disk we're installing grub to, which in this video, it's forward slash dev forward slash SDA. Not the partition, not SDA1, not SDA2, or whatever but just the disk, forward slash dev, forward slash SDA. I'm going to press enter, and as you can see, it says installation finished, no errors reported. And if we do an ls command and list the boot partition, as you can see, we have an EFI in capital letters partition over there. And if we list that one, it has Alex Linux, which is, of course, the name of our setup over here of the bootloader. Now, that's the easy part over. The next step is configuring Grub itself. Now, most of you who have done an Arch Linux install will say that, hey, now we have to run the grub-mkconfig command. But we can't actually do that and have encryption work by default. We have to specify the drives we're setting up in the Etsy default Grub configuration. I'm going to just quickly show you guys what it looks like. Etsy default 
grub. And as you can see, there's a section over here that says grub command line Linux default. In here, we're gonna have to add some options and I'm gonna show you guys how to do that. There are two main things we have to obtain and put in our grub configuration. The first is the UUID for our encrypted device. And the second one is the UUID for our decrypted device. To obtain these, we're gonna use the blkid command. We're gonna run blkid dash o value, then dash s uuid, and then the disk we're specifying. So the encrypted one is gonna be forward slash dev forward slash SDA2, which if you guys remember, that's where we ran crypt setup. So I'm gonna press enter. And as you can see, we get this output that says 423BB89F. It's just random. It's a random string of alphanumeric characters. So I'm gonna take that output. I'm gonna use two angled brackets, make sure that it's two, and I'm gonna direct it to forward slash Etsy, forward slash default, forward slash grub just like that. I'm then gonna run the command again and add another line to the config, but this time I'm gonna run it on dev mapper crypt root, which if you guys remember is our decrypted partition, the one we were able to format into ext4. So I'm gonna press enter. And now if we use nano to go into Etsy default grub again, and we go all the way to the bottom of the file, you'll see these two new lines. This one that's 423BB89, which is our encrypted partition UUID, and this one that's 45901, and so on, which is our decrypted one. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna copy these lines to the top of the file and put them where I show you. So to copy and paste, or more specifically to cut and paste in nano, you gotta do control K, on the line, so I cut the first one, and I go all the way to the top, and right under the grub command line Linux default, I'm gonna do control U, which is gonna paste it right there. Or oh, I actually went on top, oh, that's my bad, I'm gonna just put it below then, control U. There you go. Now I'm gonna use backspace to actually put it within the quotation marks, and I'm gonna add another quotation mark here at the bottom, so remember to actually close the quotation marks on grub command line Linux default. Now I'm gonna go back all the way to the bottom of the file and grab the second one. If you guys remember, 45901 is actually our decrypted root partition one, so I'm gonna do control K on that line. I'm gonna go all the way to the top, and right below the grub command line Linux default, I'm gonna do control U to paste it right there. Now that we have these two UUIDs, I'm gonna show you some stuff that you have to write around them. So before this one, which remember guys, this is the encrypted partition one, we're gonna write crypt device equals UUID equals, and then leave the UUID as it is, but after it, you wanna put a colon and then the name of the dev mapper partition that this one will be unlocking to, which if you guys remember, it was crypt root. As for the other UUID, which is the unencrypted one, we're gonna write root equals UUID, once again in capital letters, equals, then the UUID of our unencrypted partition, and then nothing after it. You don't have to add a colon or anything. Now make sure these are all on the same line. I know I put them on separate lines to make it easier, but make sure they are on the same line and separated by a space. So as you can see, if I move over here, you can actually see the other side of the line that actually finishes there. So at the end of this line, we're gonna add a quotation mark to make sure that it closes off. And I'm actually gonna delete this quotation mark here because we don't really need it. So as you can see, we have a full configuration. We have crypt device equals UUID, then equals the UUID of our encrypted partition, devsda2, and then colon crypt root, which is its destination. Then we have root equals UUID equals then the UUID of our unencrypted partition, and then just nothing after that, just a quotation mark. Now, did you catch all that? Just in case you haven't, I actually have a text guide which covers most of the steps in this tutorial to do with encryption available in the description. As you can see, I have crypt device or the encrypted partition highlighted in yellow and the unencrypted one highlighted in blue with these example UIDs that obviously aren't real. So you can follow this tutorial to double check your configuration to make sure that everything is working fine and dandy. All right, but with that done, we're pretty much done configuring our bootloader here. So I'm gonna do control O, press enter, control X to exit the file, and then I'm gonna run grub dash mkconfig space dash o forward slash boot forward slash grub then forward slash grub dot cfg and press enter. And as you can see, it generates the and as you can see, it generated the grub configuration file successfully. Don't worry about the OS probe errors; those are just for dual booting and whatnot, which we're not gonna be doing in today's video. 
Now the last thing left to do is just one little quick, you know, quality of life fix. We're gonna run systemctl enable, then capital N network, and then capital N, then capital M manager. Now this will allow our system to start working with the network immediately once we turn it on by using the network manager system service so we don't have to, you know, turn it on every time we turn on our system. This will enable networking as soon as we turn on our computer. All right, but with that done, we're pretty much finished configuring Arch Linux. We can type exit over here to leave our ch root environment and then type reboot to reboot into our system and, you know, hope for the best that it actually does boot up and prompt us for a password. So I'm going to press enter over here. Okay, so as you can see, we have grub. Our first option is Arch Linux, which, you know, that is what we need. So I'm going to press enter on it. And there you go. It actually asks us for the passphrase. So I'm going to type one, two, three, four, and press enter. And as you can see, it sent me straight to the login. Here I can log in with my user that I set up earlier. If you guys remember, I made him Alex. I made the password one, two, three, four, and I'm going to press enter. And as you can see, I'm successfully logged into Arch Linux on an encrypted system. All right, but now that we've set up this encrypted system, there's a few things we might want to do to improve the quality of life on it. The first first obvious one is setting up auto login for our user so we don't have to put in our user password every single time we go on our computer because obviously if we put in our decryption password we're going to have access to our files anyway whether we have access to the user or not so it kind of you know it nullifies the point of having a user password to do this we're going to use sudo to modify a system file nano forward slash lib forward slash system d forward slash system and then getty backslash at dot service and press enter and as you can see it's going to ask us for a password for sudoers because we set it up successfully we can type one two three four and press enter and then we're going to go down all the way until we see the part that says exec start as you can see it says spin a getty and whatnot we're going to get rid of this part over here that has the dash o option we're going to replace it with dash a, which means auto login, and then pass a username, which in our case is going to be Alex. We're going to do control O and press enter, then do control X. And now if we run sudo reboot on our system, as you can see, we're going to be prompted for a password again. I'm going to type one, two, three, four, press enter, and it sends us straight into our user. We didn't have to put in our password or our username or anything. We're already logged in as Alex, which saves us a lot of time. Now, before I close out this video, I'm gonna quickly show you guys how to set up the Plasma desktop environment, since I know that a lot of people are gonna to wanna to use that. To do that, I'm gonna run sudo pacman s plasma-desktop. You might also wanna install their terminal called console. I'm also going to install SDDM, which is the login or display manager for Plasma. That should pretty much be it. I'm gonna press enter over here and type in my password, which is 1234 once again. I'm just gonna pick Pipewire Jack since, you know, I love Pipewire. I'm gonna press enter over here. Uh, for fonts emoji, I'm just gonna press enter. In fact, most of the stuff you can just press enter. And I'm gonna press enter on this, which will automatically start installing everything. Once all those things are done installing, you can run sudo systemctl enable dash dash now sddm and press enter and it will automatically send you to the login screen here you get to select between plasma wayland and plasma x11 depending on which one you want to use i'm going to just use the wayland version and i'm going to put my password in here which as you guys know is one two three four and press enter and there you go i'm now in what looks like the latest version of kde plasma since we set up auto login on our getty i'm also going to set it up here on sddm which will allow us to automatically log into plasma when we put in our password like we did with our terminal that previous example could be used if you use a window manager like dwm or something but this example could be useful if you're genuinely using plasma from day to day so i'm going to begin by making a configuration directory for sddm by running sudo mkdir forward slash etsy forward slash sddm dot conf dot d and then i'm going to press enter obviously it's going to ask me for the password i'm going to do one two three four and in that directory i'm going to use nano to go into it etsy sddm dot conf dot d i'm going to make a file called auto login dot conf and press enter in here we're going to put some square brackets and between them i'm going to do auto login and type that with a capital a we're going to give it a user option which is going to be uh, alex in this case and then we're going to type session now in here you can either put plasma which has the default 
um, Wayland configuration or Plasma X11, which has it boot up in X11. I'm gonna just leave it on the Wayland one. Then I'm gonna do Control O, press Enter to write, and Control X to quit. And finally, if I reboot one more time by typing sudo reboot, I'm gonna be able to put in my decryption password 1234 and press Enter. And as you can see, it's automatically booting me into Plasma, just like that. So there you go. I successfully set up an encrypted system using Arch Linux. So there you go. We've successfully set up an encrypted system using Arch Linux. We have a graphical environment which automatically launches when we log in using our decryption password. I hope everybody enjoyed this comfy guide. I've been Denchi. Goodbye.